processor on it, ultra low power core on it, uh, for the because I saw that you were trying to get lower power numbers and wanted to use the RCC. All right, so um, the ESP32 module I use was from Expressive itself. Um, yeah. It's also co-made by DF Robot. Um, the ESP32 itself has a um, dual cores plus an additional core called the ultra low power real-time clock processor. <coughs> I'm from Espresso. Huh? I'm from Espresso. So oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh so you know about that, right? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Um, what I discovered when putting the ESP32 in deep sleep is that it still relies on the ultra low power CPU. However, I'm not coding for that portion yet. So the way I code for ESP32 is basically using the Arduino style of coding. Okay. I, I rely on that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I should correct myself. I have recently moved to VS Code with Arduino as extensions. All right, that's much better than the Arduino IDE itself. Yeah, so um, so the real-time clock continues operating while the main processors are shut down, thereby saving a lot of power. But um, when the main processors are shut down, the main SRAMs are also cleared of its application memory. So when the real-time clock processor wakes it up, it reloads the entire firmware. This is the way I understood from reading in the forums. And that massive inrush of current really comes from the flash chip that is alongside the ESP32, not the ESP32 itself. No, I was wondering more about the RTC. Like you had to use an external RTC. Oh uh, no, the uh, um, the reason why I had an uh, external RTC in my project was so that I could <coughs> supply a wake up line to the ESP32 itself. I did not rely on the ESP32. Internal RTC. I thought that was really helpful because I was actually in the middle of evaluating if Wi-Fi chips would be trusted. I was like, oh, okay, I read about that, and and you confirmed it, so <laughs> that's very cool. Hi, uh, I have a question. Um, with MB IOTs, how about using LoRa or TeamUI Spam instead? Oh, no, that's just a choice of my friend who wanted to explore the latest buzzword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> even later, it's even more promising as in you can I, do I'm it sorry, could you, could you say TV expand. I space, uh, sorry. Like you use the TV, the analog TV where they terminated it, the TV called analog, there is this small portion of the spectrum right. that's free to use. In the States, I think in the UK as well. Singapore, I don't think it's ready yet. Mm. Okay, I'm not familiar with all these. I tried to look up on all these terminologies in a website called 3GPT.org <laughs> and I saw the release matrix of the documents. It ranged over a thousand documents, so I, I got lost. <laughs> so I rely on the module's ability to give me what I wanted. Uh, I have a question regarding PS Lab. So can you do a uh, signal generator and uh, CRO thing at the same time? And if not, uh, is there any time to implement it in future versions? Uh, do you mean the oscilloscope features and the signal generator feature at the same time? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, we should use that in demonstration. Uh, we are generating a sine wave and weaving it from the oscilloscope. So what are the present drawbacks of this stuff? Uh, present drawbacks is the bandwidth it can support. Uh, it can sample at 2 million samples per second. But uh, I recommend to go about 100 kilohertz to 2500 kilohertz. But in our day to day experiments in schools, we usually normally don't go beyond that bandwidth. So this lab is kind of uh, okay for school experiments. Uh, but if you want to go to a high range, uh, then there is a problem. But uh, since this one is very cheap <coughs> and portable, and have so many features, I think we are kind of okay with the features we are going to be having. I actually really like the included a current source on it because it's like super, super useful for a lot of science and like teaching. It's like, like there's not enough current source. Everyone thinks in terms of voltage, right? That's really cool. <coughs> I'm really fascinated by the fact that we talked about um, verifying pieces using. Yeah. Uh, is this something that, that's done in the industry? Is this 
No, the, the, so the question was, is the, uh, is the laser for verifying ASICs um, a thing that's common? And the answer is no. Um, it's a technique. I, as far as I know, I had to come up with it on my own. And actually, literally part of the reason I'm presenting it here is because I'm trying to keep other people from patenting it. Um, the, the first thing I've gotten from several people I've talked to is like, are you going to patent it? And I'm actually, I'm a little worried because I'm collaborating with some, or talking to some companies whose policies have patent everything they touch, regardless if they invented it or not. And so I'm trying hard to like disclose, put in the blockchain that I have it there, get a prior art date, right? I just want to not have this exit, like the domain of people to be able to use. Yeah. Have you tried it yourself? I have not tried it myself. That is one of the things that needs to be done, but there are papers <coughs> that have indicated um, particularly of optical phone induction for the purpose of like maliciously <coughs> attacking an MCU has been demonstrated by Ross Anderson's lab in Cambridge, but it's on a much older generation of chip. And so one of the things that needs to be done is on the tar target geometry, like 40 nanometer, how, do the, how does the you know, extra carriers are generated photons interact with the transistors? Is it enough interaction to cause a bit to flip or something like that? So that's a core assumption that does need to be validated, but I, I'm pretty optimistic because you know light does interact with silicon, it will generate carriers, and then should at some strength cause a problem. Um, just you know, the question in my head is like, is is there a strength at which like it causes a latch up instead of verification or something terrible like that, right? <coughs> source projects I see on the web, they generally are categorized as <coughs> products. I mean, nothing too dangerous. What if an open source project causes injury? How do we protect ourselves? I kind of have a related uh, anecdote for that. Uh, that was going to be my next question. Uh, I was part, interning at an open source firmware for drones project a couple of years ago. And around that time, uh, there were news about ISIS using uh, cherry red drones to send bombs over, right? Uh, now, this was an ethical question even then. Uh, one of my mentors kind of gave me an answer then that, you know, it's worth the cost. Like, uh, it pro I probably uh, did not phrase it correctly, but uh, it's still better open sourcing it. So I just want to kind of ask that in that context. Like if open sourcing a project for building drones results in not nice people using it, is it still worthy doing it? So I mean, it's an open question. Uh, malicious use of open hardware. You know, once we put something out into the world, you know, the, the question is about what, what if someone uses your project maliciously if it's open source? Um, that'll happen whether it's open source or not. When you put something out into the world, even if it's patented, um, you have no control over what people do with it. If someone's going to do something malicious, they don't care if they're infringing <laughs> on a patent. <laughs> they don't care if they're uh, violating an open source license either. Um, if they want to harm you, they can say, yeah. Mitch Altman did this thing, and I'm giving him credit for my malicious act. Uh, that's not something I'd be proud of. But uh, once you put something out in the world, you have no control over what people do with it. So I think it's really important to think about what's going to happen in the cultural and social context with your project. What will it best be suited for? And that's what it will be used for. But you know, anyone can use anything for, uh, for harm. Like I can, uh, I can, not that I want to, but I can take this mic and start bonking, <laughs> bonking people on the heads. Um, that's not what microphones are intended for, but you know, I, I could physically do that. Um, but if I make a gun, clearly it's gonna be used to harm people. Um, if I make a drone, well, we already know what the US military has done with drones. Um, it was started by a bunch of German hackers, uh, uh, and it was presented publicly the first time uh, in the first hacker conference that I went to in Germany in 2006, I think that was. And uh, it was awesome. No one was thinking that this was going to be used to kill people in Yemen. Uh, I think I just <coughs> a couple of things. 
Uh, first thing is most, the most important part of every open source license, software or hardware, is the uh, don't sue me clause. Like, you know, you use it at your own risk. So software in particular is like, this, I don't know if you read this code has no fitness for any purpose whatsoever, basically. There's a, you can't quite do that with hardware and say this hardware is like, you know, a brick and therefore you should pay me for it. There's some, like, you know, you have to warn that it does what it does, but um, there is a, a, a limitation of liability there. Um, the other thing I would add is that a, a lot of technology is dual use. Almost every technology, like when we, you know, when we harnessed fire, we could cook food and we could also burn people on the stake, right? You know, this was just, this was the moment technology came into the hands of humans, um, technology itself, I think, is neither good nor bad. It's like water; you you need it, um, but you can also drown in it. Um, and then the question is just, you know, in the process of disclosing and sharing, what are the channels you use, and how do you express it? And then, yes, there's a there's a step that has to be taken, for example, to weaponize a drone, right? There's a step you have to take to weaponize gunpowder. There's a step you have to take to weaponize an exploit. The step you have to take to weaponize, you know, any type of thing, so to make it particularly effective against humans. And so, if you are trying to tweak the parameters of your, of your technology to be optimally harmful to humans, then that's, you know, that's something you should ideally avoid. But if you're just trying, if you're like, oh, I want to play around with high voltage circuits, and I think it's really interesting, and you're not, you know, saying, well, these electrodes are really good for like shocking people or something like this. But you're just saying, no, this is how you do high voltage, and you have to be careful, and all these sorts of things. And you put a circuit there that can generate a thousand volts, and it can hurt. And you tell people about that. I mean, like, there's a lot of really useful applications for high voltage sources, and I think <coughs> we should have that out there and, and, and make it available for people to use. So, so I have a follow-up question. So, uh, uh, for example, GPS. Doesn't work above certain altitudes. Commercially available GPS doesn't work beyond certain altitudes or speeds, <coughs> and that's there as a limitation so that you know you can't just make a missile out of your garage, right? So there have been uh, limitations that have been placed. The question is like, do we need those kind of things? Do we need certifications? For example, I come from India. We have passed a law which says that if I have to buy a drone which is bigger than a particular size, I have to register with the government. <coughs> right now, this kind of gets in the way of me building my own, right? Because then I, I have to follow certain steps. It's also not great for anonymity because then I have to register my government ID against the drone and all of those things. So, are there like do you guys think these are good enough uh, measures that we can put? Uh, because Finally, we are the ones who are making these hardware, and we are the ones that we have to yeah. come up with these ideas, come up with these certifications, and pass them. Right? And then there are some open source gun design. You can do it in that role. Yes, you can, but yeah. Uh, so uh, people are discussing in the audience about uh, you know should there be like government regulations? Should there be limitations to technology? to try to prevent uh, malicious activity with projects that we create. And um, you know, if, if we put the limitations in, then that limits what we can do with them. At the same time, um, it limits the harm that can be done. So there's trade-offs. Uh, in the United States, there are a bunch of people dying from guns all the time. And there's laws that people um, need to register their weapons in order to use them, and that has been uh, effective at limiting the number of murders uh, with guns. Of course, there are people who will just get a gun beyond the registration also, but it at least prevented uh, someone from being super mad going out buying a gun and killing someone uh, while they're still hot. Uh, maybe there can be government regula regulations. I mean, if we have governments, we might as well have them doing something useful rather than just taking our tax money. But. Um, uh, yeah, but these are all trade-offs. You know, we don't live, whatever, whoever you are and whatever your points of view, everyone will agree we don't live in a perfect world and no one can even define what that means. So we have to make use uh, uh, of the world that we actually live in and try to do our best. So uh, if you feel it's your calling to try to go uh, push for government regulations to limit certain kind of technologies that can harm people, <coughs> maybe that's something to do. 
uh, if you, but like for myself, I just, I've worked so many different places as a consultant and every single place I've worked, the US military has come in, someone from the US military has come in and said, we want what you all have done. This, this cool computer game can be used as a, uh, a killer helicopter simulator if we just get a few custom tweaks here. And uh, I, you know, I helped create virtual reality and people from the US military came in and they, they wanted to use it as a World War III training simulator, right? So, um, you know, like I don't want to help do that kind of stuff, but when you do anything, if it's a, a new tool, it can be used, and therefore it will be used, uh, to harm people, because we've got seven billion people on our planet, and some percentage of them are very highly paid to look at any new tool that comes out, any new technology to come, that comes out to be used for weapons of mass destruction, and those people work for the U.S. military and other militaries. So, um, you know, what do we do to prevent that? Government regulation isn't going to stop that. Um, you know, this is a huge can of worms, right? Um, we're talking about ethics, and there's no absolute right and wrong. But what do you feel? You know, like you're working on a project. If it's something that you know is going to be used for harm, but you're doing it anyways. That's probably not a good idea. But if you're enthusiastic about making drones like these German hackers, and it's really cool, and they didn't really think about um, it's going to be used to kill people in Yemen and other places, eventually, you know, I wouldn't hold them culpable. But you know, we live in a world where these kind of things are going to happen. So I think it's our responsibility as creators to think about that to the best of our ability and put it out in a context of coolness rather than harm. I think I'll just add on to it. I think it's not just uh, we should rely on governments to police us, but I think having this conversation in this crowd is very helpful. And that if you see someone, your colleagues doing something that could be harmful, like, hey, like, you know, maybe, you know, sort of the AI processing you're doing is a little scary and creepy, and you should think about pulling that in. If you just, and you just telling your colleague that might actually be much more impactful than any like government telling them right or wrong, because it ultimately it comes from community standards, right? And we have to sort of, as individuals, just, you know, sometimes just say, hey, like, you know, it's not like you're bad or something like that, but, you know, did you ever consider that maybe that could be creepy or that could be bad or something like this? And then just make them think about it. And then I'm sort of a fundamental optimist that if you just, 99% of the humans plus, you know, if you tell them that, they'll probably do the right thing. There's, there's a small percentage you really do have to enforce them, but um, I think that's good. It's a good start. So. Uh, given the same trend of thought on how far open source hardware has come, can each of you share the most complex or challenging open source software, um, sorry, hardware that you've seen online? Most, most challenging and complex. Can each of you share? Yeah, it was funny laptop. <laughs> I concur. No, come on. It sucks. No. <laughs> I started my open source you know, how to develop a new PS lab, and it was pretty complicated, and I. I'm not much familiar with this laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I think for the moment, uh, PSL was my first computer. No, I, I uh, already said. Um, I think, I think actually, if you expand the definition of open source to include, like the realm of, like open source licenses themselves are sort of like relatively recent thing. We can include like all of like the physics papers and stuff from the 60s and, and when people actually disclosed and published things. There's some like incredibly cool stuff that people did like in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and you can download the schematics and look at it and just like, um, you know, I think you can actually download like the Apollo moon landers design now. That's like an incredible piece of hardware. It's so cool. There's so many, like what people had to do was so little back then. Like they landed people on the moon with like two kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> and then I tell people I won't put four megabytes and be trusted, and like, you can't do nine and four megabytes. It's impossible, right? I'm like, we landed people on the moon with two kilobytes. And they wove it by hand with a cord, right? I mean, it's anyways, so. I 
actually, that was going to be my question. <coughs> now, can you expand more on the nebulous, the CPU and that subsystem of your be trusted? <coughs> like, what kind of thing are you looking at? Because IMEs are going to use a lot of RAM and storage. Yeah, yeah. Of course, just right. like human right. languages are like that. Right, okay. So, yeah, very so the question was, like, can I talk a little about what the what I'm thinking about for the chip inside be trusted? So the, the logic goes, we define what we want to do with it. So it's the text base with the IME and, and sort of the voice. And then you work backwards from there to what is the right size of the chip. And you don't make it the biggest chip possible because it makes it too expensive, right? And what you find when you work backwards is that the, the, limit, the limiting factor is RAM, how much RAM you can put in there. And so um, and this is why I got onto like the verification of deep sub nanometer, nanometer silicon because there's a bunch of guys actually working in open fabs in like 130 nanometer range, but for like a chip, like four megabytes of RAM is like a chip this big in like 130 nanometer, and then like in 40 nanometer it's a chip this big, right? So it's a reasonable amount. So um, so then once you pick the, the node, say 40 nanometer, you pick that because it's like where the mass kind of fall off and become really cheap. Anything beyond that, start, the price starts to go up again. Um, uh, then the transistors all perform at a certain rate. So, you know, they're basically free as far as the CPU is concerned. It'd be a 32 bit RISC V computer with some crypto accelerators. It'll probably run at hundreds of megahertz, right? You know, more speed than you ever need for the application. But it's going to be about four megabytes of RAM. Um, the flash will be off chip, but then signature verified and pulled in, so you can have arbitrary amounts of off mic storage. Um, and then probably also integrated would be like some ADC, some DAC, some housekeeping stuff. Um, and, that, and that would be it, but try to keep it very minimal. And the idea is it's a very minimal design, just a big pile of RAM and a 32 bit RISC V CPU with architectures really open for its print inspection. And then on top of that, the, the next module on top of that is in order to facilitate with the silicon inspection, every, basically every register gets instrumented with a readout path. So the idea is you basically stop the clock, fire a laser in there, right? And you say, okay, we had this pattern before, now after you fire the laser, what's the pattern of all the registers? You read that out and you say, okay, well, the laser must have been in this set of logic because these are the affected paths. And you move the laser and do it again. So there needs to be some readout path. And then on top of that, there's um, but there's another modulus, which is that there, there are blocks even as a designer. So I'm gonna be, as a designer, I get a, piece, a map of the chip back that shows me where all the standard cells that I designed are. <coughs> But for example, the RAM itself is a hard IP block, which means that the foundry puts it in. I don't get to see the RAM. I never actually see the RAM design. So they can put implants inside the RAM. And so I have to harden against that. So before I go to the RAM, I have to add some things that go ahead and swap around the address space randomly. And there's a bunch of stuff to make it so that if you put something inside the RAM block, it's not like, oh, I just packed over byte eight and you always get like you know, the boot vector or something like that, right? It's now you have to put a much more complicated thing inside the RAM which means it has to fundamentally grow larger, which means I'm going to detect that as I, as I scan through the device. Right. So, so there's a bunch of little tricks like that, that. That It's really more about exploring those tricks and not so much about um, you know, necessarily building a quad core, yeah, yeah, multi gigahertz, yeah. you know, whatever it is, thing that a lot of people are really interested in. So. I think I ate up all the time. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you very much. Well, thank you very much to, to the panel for this session.